Thanks, Brian. Thanks for inviting me. So, uh, you know, today we are going to talk about fundamentals of uh, conventional LINAC uh, acceptance testing. This is a topic that uh, many of us would be familiar with, but it is always you know, good to review once in a while. Uh, so it's a SAM session, so there are going to be questions, so, you know, be ready. So, you know, the learning objectives are to learn the details about technical specification of the acceptance test and to understand the tests to be performed at acceptance testing and also the acceptance testing process, which is kind of actually changing in, in the last, you know, five, six years, you know, and in, in, in things are getting a little bit more complicated with the LINAX. And then automated tests and quantitative data that should be provided during acceptance testing for facilitating ongoing QA and upgrades. This vendors are not doing that great a job with this. We, we will talk about in a few of the recent work that's been happening um, in research, you know, you know areas uh, about about this quantitative and automated test. And also, how can one maximize the overlap of acceptance testing and commissioning process? There is always a little bit of confusion, you know, you know which, which test, you know, we are kind of trying to do the same thing in both. So try to see what we can do. Um, conventional LINACs, so what it is, it is basically a gantry-mounted radiation generating system. You know, things like, you know, uh, your radiant true beam or, you know, C series machines or Electa Synergy or Versa HD. Uh, what we are not going to, you know, talk about is, is you know, uh, specialized image-guided IMRT systems like tomotherapy or specialized radio surgery systems like CyberKnife. We, you know, we are not going to talk about, in a, um, about acceptance testing process of that. Um, you know, Linux, you know, we had analog Linux, you know, with the, especially with varying uh, machines with the IX and the trilogies and C-series machines. There were, you know, analog Linux and, and there are Electas were, you know, for a long time they were digital Linux and Varian has uh, released their TrueBeam platform, which are digital Linux. So there are kind of about 500 Linux in USA, including both analog and 5,000 Linux in US, including both analog and digital. If you think about it, it's, it's, it's probably like a 10 per, per, per state, you know. So, so why a new TG? We're not going to talk a lot about the TG today, but you know we have a TG report 210 uh, that is looking at uh, acceptance testing uh, recommendation. So, so the current guidelines for acceptance testing comes from TG 45. You know it's a 1994 edition. You know a lot of things have changed in the last 22 years. So if you look at what is happening with the vendor acceptance testing, you know you know you know the test and the documentation is getting you know, reducing as we you know. But the technology and the complexity is actually increasing, so it doesn't it doesn't make sense why why the number of tests that is required is kind of reduced from an acceptance testing point of view, and also there is no clear um, in a tolerance of an acceptance test. You know, for example, we have a lot of recommendation from TG reports, uh, TG 142, TG 106, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but you know, when vendor uses their own you know tools and their own proprietary you know phantoms uh, and and calculate the uh, tolerances on on their own you know um, criteria it is very difficult to compare you know what is acceptable what is not acceptable the other thing is no quantitative data that can, that can be used in future you know you know things like you know if if you know 3 years later if a major part has changed is there any way that i can compare you know quantitatively how the lonac was during acceptance testing and now after a major part change um, and other things uh, like guidance on what is the vendor's responsibility and what is the clinical site responsibility. There have been anecdotal uh, things like where there is disagreement between facility and sites and installation and commissioning and acceptance testing has stalled you know, because of you know, lack of uh, understanding. Um, and also a guidance on special requirements and requests like beam matching if you want to do you know, tune your beams or if you want to match multiple machines or if you want to have energies that are not conventional and used energies, fine tune your radio radiation ISIS center, you know, these requirements and how it needs to be stated in, a, in, a, in the contract and how to ensure that, you know, it was actually delivered. Um, um, so they are, they are, there are issues there. So, you know, modern Linux, they're not any more conventional, right? You know, if you look at this, it's a very sleek design, uh, the true beam machine. Um, I'm not, you know, you know, I'm vendor neutral, but, you know, I have more familiar with uh, variant machines, so I picked that. So, you know, now, you know, these machines have imaging components, too. You know, in, in 1994, when TG45 was done, you know, there was no imaging component. We need to take care of that. Um, you know, we have couch. You know, some, you know, ready surgery machines come with 6D couch, so we need to accept that couch and or carbon fiber couch if you're using rapid arc we need to know criteria for accepting that um, and you know MLCs you know there are becoming more and more uh, uh, sophisticated um, like you know in a, in a, electors MLCs can go up to like five cm's per second 
we need to figure out a way to um, accept those. Uh, additionally, you know, if you have a radio surgery system, if there is a cone system, we need to be able to accept that. And also technique-specific acceptance testing, if the vendor has promised that this Linac can deliver a certain technology, you know, we need to know at the time of acceptance testing, you know, how to verify that. Most of these tests are currently done in a more of a functional way because there is no dosimetric data is collected, there is no, you know, planning system is ready to assess the uh, in a dosimetric in a validity of these deliveries. So there are still some, some challenges at the time of acceptance testing how to go about this. So TG210 uh, is a work in progress. You know, the goal for this is to recommend the technical specification that should be included in the purchase contract. You know, that's, you know, I, we, you know typically you know, physicist sometimes doesn't get involved at that stage. So it's a very important piece because this is the obligation of the acceptance testing and the vendors is the contractual obligation, how to basically read it, how to make sure that we put the right things in the, in the purchase contract and to provide definition of performance specification of major LINAC components. This is, this is straightforward stuff we do. Um, and make recommendation on tests that should be performed during acceptance testing, you know, including what the vendor is providing, and also some of these things that what we should do before actually you know, letting the installer go or signing on the dotted line. So um, components of QA, this is you know, very, very familiar, right? Acceptance testing, commissioning, and pre periodic quality assurance. Very basic. What is acceptance testing is, you know, FDA requirements involving vendor and customer to validate that the device meets the contractual specification. Commissioning is, you know, is, it comes after that. There is kind of a little bit of an overlap, but the way that the conventional LINAC, we kind of separate the acceptance testing and commissioning process where we get baseline uh, measurement and acquisition of beam data, you know, trying to put, do beam modeling and end-to-end -end test. They're all part of the commissioning that is not part of the, you know, AT. Um, you know, periodic uh, quality assurance in its verification of, we just need to make sure that the baseline, there is no deviation from the baseline that we established during the commissioning process. And that's what we do in a monthly, annual, and daily in a quality assurance. So, you know, acceptance testing versus commissioning. Um, you know, if you look at, if you look at specialized treatment in, in a systems like CyberNAF or, 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 uh, or uh, tomotherapy, they come commissioned. You know, we just do the validation and we ensure that, you know, things are, things are, um, you know, uh, appropriate. But when it comes down to LINAC, you have to do acceptance testing and commissioning in two separate pieces. Um, you know, the acceptance testing is whether the clinic got what it thought it was purchased. You know, to ensure safety of the operator and the patient. This is important during the, during the acceptance testing process. And provide baseline for future performance evaluation. This is where currently there is a shortfall, you know, um, in how the acceptance testing are performed, where, you know, whether the acceptance testing, whether they are providing a baseline data for us. Um, commissioning, we talked about it. It is, it is basically making sure that you are preparing your LINAC to be ready for clinical use, okay? Um, beam data collection and developing procedures and, and, and training of the staff and all those things include during the commissioning process. So now, you know, we have a, we have a Sam question. Um, approximately how many uh, linear accelerators are currently registered in U.S.? The options are 500, 1,000, uh, 2,500, 5,000, and 10,000. So that's right, it's, it's about, it's about 5,000 uh, in a LINAX. So anatomy of the LINAX, this is a very basic slide. You know, this is, this is the slide that I recommend all of my residents to know. You know, we need to understand the major components of the LINAX, you know, before doing the acceptance testing. You know, uh, you know these days when you're doing, in a, in a LINAX versus a true beam, you, in a true beam architecture is completely different. If you don't understand the LINAX, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the anatomy, it is, it is difficult for you to ask questions. How many targets, how many flattening filter, you know, how many scattering foil, how many energy selections that you have, you know, what affects what. If you wanted to understand those things, you need to understand the anatomy of, of the LINAX. So, um, so this is a typical acceptance testing table of contents. This is a CLINAC um, uh, 2100. You can see there is around 60 odd, odd pages um, of, um, of, of documentation that we actually go through. You know, it starts with radiation survey, mechanical test, radiation isocenter test, beam performance, dosimetry, and then dynamic arc therapy, enhanced dynamic wedge, laser guard collision, and you know, some tr operator training. 
So uh, the, first, the first and the foremost important thing that we need to do is general safety. You know, we need to make sure, even before doing the radiation safety, you need to make sure the machine is, is having the right safety features for the installer, for the staff, and for the machine itself. So testing all the anti-collision you know, anti checks, you know, the couch locks, you know, whether you know, you know, the maximum uh, weight bearing level, whether the emergency you know, switch and the connections are working, this is very important even before starting the radiation test. So the radiation test is, you know, at first beam on, you do a customary survey, right? We need to ensure that, you know, all the, uh, all the shielding goals are basically met. So we do a customer survey. Following that, you do a formal full survey because you have done a shielding, um, you know, a priori, right? So you need to make sure that whether all all of your uh, all of your uh, um, uh, you know barriers, primary and secondary barriers, are done uh, properly. And also some, you know, one other major thing is also you know it's a it's a requirement is uh, you know your leakage from your from your uh, from your lenag. It, it got to be like 0.1 percent of your isocenter dose. So we need to main, ensure that. If you have a LINAC that is greater than 10 MV, then you need to make sure that in the LINAC, you know, uh, whether the neutrons, you know, whether, you know, the neutron contribution because the photoneutron interaction, you know, is high enough that it can actually create a neutron uh, issue. So you need to make sure that we measure that. Some of the equipments that you need um, from a radiation survey point of view is a geiger muller counter and a large volume ion chamber. The Geiger counters, you can use it if you want to figure out if there is any crack in, in your shielding or if there is any holes that have been drilled where it's supposed not supposed to be, you can use Geiger counter or you can use a large volume ion chamber if you wanted to figure out an instantaneous dose rate you know, to figure out whether your radiation shielding goals, or your occupational limit or your public limit, depending upon what area it is, controlled or not controlled, whether they are met. So you need to have that. Um, these did, you know, for, for, for um, energies greater than, LNAC having energies greater than 10 MeV, you know, of course, you know, neutron deduction, you know, typical thing is like a bubble counter, which has in you know, a boron um, um, F3 counters uh, should, be, should be used to quantify that. Leakage measurement process, you know, first thing is you need to identify where is the highest spot um, of leakage. So you do a kind of a, you know, wrap things around the, uh, around the LINAC and, you know, close the jaws and deliver high monetary units. Try to figure out where is your, where is your highest spot. Once you realize where is your highest, um, you know, uh, leakage spot, then you basically make a measurement, you know, at ISO center and also at um, at at the at the uh, one meter from the source to determine whether it is, you know, 0.1 percent of the ISO center dose for your leakage measurements. So, and then from then on, you know, these tests needs to be happen in sequential, like the general safety test, and then the radiation uh, uh, is safety, and then you get into mechanical test. You know, mechanical test we have all kinds of tests. You know, we typically adapted most of the vendor recommended test into our into our periodic QA. But you know, and also depending upon your LINAC, you know, things change. You know, mechanical isocenter verification with with uh, with rotation, collimator rotation you know, gantry rotation, couch rotation, they all have some tolerance. Um, you know, light field, field light and cross head alignment, and also your jaw re readouts. Um, you know, if you look at a true beam, they don't have any digital readout at the console, nor mechanical markings um, of, your, of your couch. It's all, it's all digital, it's all electronic. But if it's a C-series machine, there is a mechanical readout, and then there is actually a digital readout. You need to make sure they are all, um, they're all within, uh, within tolerance. Um, so these parts are all not quantitative, they're all, all qualitative, especially you know, if you look at a gantry rotation calibration, you know, or, or even collimator rotation calibration, you know, historically it is done with a graph paper and a front pointer where you can actually figure out you know, what is the wobble. You know? So these are some of, the, some of the issues that we have because you know, if it is not quantitative, down the line after, after you know, six months or after a year, after, after three years, if you're going to do any major upgrades, you know, if you're having a non-IGRT machine and if you're upgrading it to an IGRT machine, there is no way that you can actually quantitatively compare what was the status of the machine when you actually initially installed and now because you're doing, you know, tests that are more, uh, more you know, qualitative. You know, here you can see, you know, you have two pointers where you kind of rotate your gantry and see how much is the wobble. You know, visually, visually you just kind of see uh, things. Optical distance indicator, you know, which is used to set up the patient, you know, so you need to make sure that you have, you know, 100 cm from the source is kind of uh, reflected uh, properly. Um, you know, radiation to light field, you know, radiographic films and pinpricks, it's pretty popular way to do this. Again, these 
these tests are all, again, is not quantitative, right? We cannot save this data and, and kind of compare it down the line. It's also subjective depending upon how the test is done and who is doing, how you're interpreting. There are, there are some variations. Um, radiation isocenter test, very important. You know, you know we do this with uh, star shots, conventional way of doing it, you know, making a slit with your collimators. Again, this, uh, this test, you know, varies depending upon, you know, how well is your jaw is calibrated in a way that the X jaws or Y jaws, uh, but, uh, you know, we can have, uh, you know, we can, we can still make uh, uh, some good uh, guesstimate of uh, what is the radiation isocenter. So here comes another Sam's question. So which of the following equipment is required or, or required for radiation survey? So you have GM counter, large volume ion chamber, GM counter and small volume ion chamber, GM counter and large volume ion chamber, and detector diode array. That's right. In a GM counter alone, you know, you cannot get an instantaneous uh, dose rate. Large volume ion chamber, you can get, but it is not, you know, sensitive enough to pick up cracks. GM counter and small volume ion chamber, you don't want small volume ion chamber because it is, you know, you don't have enough signal, so the signal to noise ratio will be an issue. So the right answer is GM counter and large volume ion chamber. Detector diode array is typically used for, you know, patient uh, specific uh, quality assurance. So the next stage in, after the mechanical tests are done, it's beam performance test. You know, this is, this is where, you know, some vendors have made some progress with, uh, you know, with providing uh, consensus data set like, uh, like Varian where they kind of provide you a golden beam data for their, you know, CCS machine or for their uh, true beam machines. But again, during the time of acceptance testing, still there is, there is, there is issues because, uh, you know, they use their own, um, you know, if you're talking about Varian, they use something called bootle ship. We would like to use a large water tank which we will use for commissioning and also for uh, um, for periodic in you know, a QA, but you know when they come with their data and they're presenting it their data that you know this is basically what our bunker data and how it just matches on, on site after after installation. This data is not kind of useful for us, you know, in you know, a long term. We cannot use the data for anything else. So and also the way that they calculate flatness and symmetry might be slightly different than how we are calculating flatness and symmetry. So um, all these, you know, uh, electron PDDs, you know, flatness and symmetry, all these things needs to be established, uh, and, and the tolerances are, you know, variant tolerances are different than what tolerances that we typically use according to TG142 or TG40. Uh, but TG142 moved to a performance base because of, you know, reasons like that. So, you know, here you can see, you know, a gentleman using a reference chamber and a, uh, and a, a field chamber. The reference chamber is typically used for, uh, you know, in, in it because we are talking about pulsed beam, right? This is not like a cobalt machine. This is not a reliable radiation source. So any fluctuation in the beam output or dose rate is kind of taken out so that, you know, when, when the chamber goes down or across, the dose fall off is simply because of the attenuation, not because of dose fluctuation. Um, so um, again, you know, when you are using uh, output measurements, you need to be careful, you know, depending upon if you're using small field output as an area where, you know, things have a, Things have happened, so you need to choose your right detector. If you're using, if you're measuring something three by three or one by one, a, a silicon diode is much more better compared to an ion chamber because ion chamber has volume averaging. Uh, uh, a diode has because of a small size. You know, it is it is better to use. But at the same time, whenever you use, you use diodes, you need to be careful because of you know its response to low energy photons because of predominant photoelectric effect. So you need to keep that in mind. But at the same time, you know, you know, you need to pick the right tools for your, for your measurements. Um, after the beam performance test, there's a bunch of dosimetry tests, you know, kind of um, important, you know, things like MU linearity, you know, dose reproducibility, dose rate consistency, all those, all those tests needs to be done, in backup chamber, end effect, all those things you need to ensure that, you know, they're all a part of the acceptance testing. Um, and things like enhanced dynamic wedge, you know, it's a functional test. There is no, there is no um, dosimetric or, or, or quantitative test that, that happens during acceptance testing, uh, but there is a functional test. It works. Why one jaw moves? Why two jaw moves? So that is basically where, you know, the, the vendors leave us. Um, laser guard collision protection system that comes with, in most of the LUNAC, some people decide to turn it off because it's, you know, 
uh, um, causing problem, but that is something that is very important to uh, go through and, and check. Um, and then obviously, you know, operation um, uh, training. You know, we need to, most of the time, you know, people take the time of acceptance testing to learn the machine. Uh, a few of the issues that has is whether when the physicists need to go to training, you know, before, uh, before the acceptance testing or act after the acceptance testing. Before the acceptance testing, it is good so that he can meet, get familiar with the machine. After the acceptance testing, he can ask more questions. So there is, there is pros and cons, you know, um, how, how, you, how you do this. Um, um, if you look at variant true beams acceptance testing, you know, they have added a lot of new stuff, you know, uh, with the imaging component, but, but the number of pages kind of reduced, you know. So, so um, you know, from, they went from our 60 R to 42 uh, pages, and, um, you know, this is including, including ICVI um, uh, tests. So this is where the question comes is whether, whether the vendors are basically um, trying to trying to make the acceptance testing process more efficient and spending less time at the clinical site, um, and not not giving the clear recommendation is important. So a few of these tests, like MLC's uh, test, you know, they do only a functional test, and they use mostly Dynalog files to tell that you know, yeah, if you have a plan that is exceeding the MLC speed limit, it kind of it, the machine kind of interlocks, or you know, the position like it is using Dynalogs. But for us, we wanted to have something more in you know, a physical. We do things like picket fence for positioning accuracy. Um, so it's still, we don't know what are the tolerances that we need to we need to give for tools like Dynalogs, which are kind of a vendor tools. Other things like you know, in a table sag or table, you know, uh, you know, in a transmission, you know, if you have a additional device like RPM, where you, you know, where you look up for those recommendations, you know, we have we have we have a lot of task group reports piecemealing each and every component, but at the time of acceptance testing, how you basically hold the vendor um, um, accountable for for these things, uh, imaging QA, it's kind of introduced these days. This is a part of all the LINAC acceptance testing, so we need to ensure that we go through the imaging piece of it. You know, um, warning signs and interlocks, right? You know, you have, you know, KV source and, uh, um, interlocks that you need, to, you need to test, because if there is a collision, it needs to stop. Um, and then also the MV source, in MV detector uh, collision checks, and, um, and KV detector collision checks. Um, and also, you know, X-ray, you know, definitely, in X-ray warning signs are basically in, in, in place. Mechanical accuracy, you know, KV source, you know, and detector position accuracy. And if you if you think about, you know, how at least the variant uh, detector works is, uh, you know, they put a they put a, a, a digital radical. So if that is a detector is physically in a different location, um, and you know, when you throw in a digital radical, you're not actually in a, in a, you know having the right magnification. So it's very important to ensure that you test the uh, detector position um, um, and measure, you know, from the, from the ISO center. Um, if, you're, if you're all, you know, it also becomes very, very important uh, from an SBRT point of view, checking your imaging ISO center because these days, you know, many places are moving away from using a body frame, you know, or even for cranial treatments, they're not using, um, uh, we are not using, um, you know, uh, actual physical frames. So the real stereotaxy, you know, of the treatment comes from the imaging. You know, how we are able to assure submillimeter accuracy is because of the imaging. The imaging makes the treatment, you know, you know stereotactic. So we need to be able to be submillimeter accuracy with imaging because we are no more using body frames or, or our head frames if you're, if you're, if you're doing for, for lung SBRT kind of stuff. So this is a kind of a, you know, equal to a Vincent-less test, uh, you know, having a ball at the, uh, at the, at the mechanical gantry assist center and, and ensuring that you have your, your, uh, your, um, uh, imaging ISO center is kind of centered. Magnification test, the vendor provides tools like, tools like a plate where it has, you know, radio opaque um, lines of field sizes where you can actually set it up and you radiate it and, and actually measure your magnification, whether it matches your digital radical and your physical and a radical like this kind of matches so that we don't run into magnification problems. Uh, quality, image quality. Things that we test during acceptance testing, you know, you know, for variant uh, machines, we use a, a Las Vegas Phantom 
uh, which of, of different, different depths and sizes so that you can test low contrast, high contrast, uh, spatial resolution, um, uh, uniformity and noise with, with just one phantom. And this sets the baseline. Now from here on, you know, from, from your monthly or, or periodic QA, you basically check against your baseline. Uh, for KV image quality, you know, you use Leeds Phantom, you know, where it also has, in you know, a different density, you know, um, uh, balls and also line pairs, where you can check, in you know, a spatial resolution and also low, low contrast resolution um, uh, stuff. So, <laughs> putting it all together, you know, there's a lot of QA recommendations that one needs to go through, you know, when at the time of acceptance testing, you know, since because we don't have clear you know, guidelines on, you know, what are the tolerances, you know, we have to depend upon other periodic QA recommendations, and there are plenty of them. You know, if you're talking about, you know, a respiratory gating system that is added on to your LENAC, you know, when you need to test it, we need to go through a you know, task group. Uh, so this is a very short list of task group that you have to actually um, go through. So times for a SAMS question, okay? So which detector can be used for small field data collection required for IMRT field sizes less than 3 by 3 cm? So the ion chambers with 4 to 6 millimeter radius sensitive volume, diodes, ion chamber with active volume of 0.6 in you know, cubic centimeters, detector array, and well chamber. Thank you. Absolutely. So diodes. So the answer is diodes. Yes, you know, if, if you're looking at this three ion chamber with active volume of 0.6, it's our former chamber, you know, we use for monthly detector array for IMRT, well chamber typically used for brachytherapy sources. So one more Sam's question right away. What is the advantage of using a reference detector during water tank measurements? Okay. To remove fluctuation in the beam output, faster scanning time, can collect dose profile and dose rate in air, accounts for perturbation of the beam, none of the above. So that's right. The right answer is to remove the fluctuation of the beam output because we are talking about pulsed beam and the LINAC, so the radiation uh, is not a reliable source in terms of dose rate. Um, faster scanning time doesn't make sense because reference detector doesn't move. Dose profile in air, it's not moving, but dose rate in air might be a for perturbation of the beam. It perturbates the beam, so it doesn't make sense. The answer is to remove the fluctuation of the, in the beam output. So some of, the, some of the recent research that is actually looking at um, acceptance testing and commissioning process, uh, um, you know, this work is actually, you know, uh, they, they talked in uh, AAPM last year, is, you know, to use um, a robust and efficient process for acceptance testing of variant true beam LENACs using electronic portal imager, you know. So I was not able to get a few, few of those slides, but the idea there is to, uh, you know, kind of automate the acceptance testing process more quantitatively and automated and be able to do it in six to seven hours. And that is the goal. The goal for their work is use the EPID to see whether they can figure out an energy change of, you know, one percent. Can they see, you know, see a, in a symmetry change of one percent where they can actually take out the, the, the water tank, which kind of gives you a quantitative data that you can use, you know, for, for, for uh, um, you know, in future, if you wanted to figure out, you know, where the mission status was. So this is a very, very interesting work. Uh, at the same time, the vendors are also moving, you know, in some sense towards this. Uh, um, in in TrueBeam 2.0 and MR Release 1, vendor kind of opened this tool, which is machine performance check, to the to the customers too. It's a pretty cool tool, you know, where it has a phantom and it has a lot of BBs, in, you know, in known location. Once you set up to the ISO center, you take, uh, you know, multiple projection in in like a, you know like an arc fashion, like 24 to 25 projection. And once the projections are all done in different sequences of collimator and couch and gantry, it kind of spits you the numbers of your, 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 uh, in a, in a, your ISO center size and accuracy and your, and your um, you know, uh, collimation, your gantry, your, uh, you know, your field size, all the other information that it basically you know, you know, puts to you in a matter of five minutes. So, uh, and also, 
It also tells you whether it kind of meets your, meets your requirements or not. Okay, so this is a pretty, you know, in a cool tool. And the other thing that it also has is it has a history. It also maintains the, the history of, of, of the logs. So you can run this test as much as you want you know, and as often as you want. It tests all of your parameters and you can see from here, it kind of tells you for all of your energies too. It kind of tells you, you know, um, if it's green, your mission performance check passed, which means that all of the you know, performance mechanical criteria are passed. If it is red, it means that some of them fail that needs you know, recalibration or re, um, you know, reestablishing. And orange means that you know, it is not, you know, um, uh, it is very close to the tolerance. And the gray ones is where you reset your baseline. You know, sometimes when you look at it and you feel you know, things are good, you, know, you basically reset your baseline and, and from then on it tracks to that baseline. So this is a very, very powerful and cool and, uh, and, and very reliable tool because it also takes away the dependency on, of who is, who is doing human dependency on interpreting the results and how one is doing. The other neat feature of this, um, this tool is also it can also tr keep track of output change. You know, like you know, now if, if in, our, in our analog, in a C-series machines or trilogy, if somebody goes and tweak the output, there is no record of you know, who tweaked the output. If a clinical engineer by mistake or even a physicist by mistake tweak the output, there is no record of output changes. But here, you know, you can actually kind of keep track of uh, all the, all the um, output changes from the baseline. So, um, another SAMS, what is not part of the conventional li linear accelerator acceptance testing? Radiation isocenter verification, radiation beam modeling in treatment planning system, radiation beam flatness and symmetry test, KV image quality verification for IGRT systems, collimator rotation accuracy. So the answer is radiation beam modeling in treatment planning system. Right now, the way that it is, is the commissioning portion of it is where you, know, you collect the baseline data and you basically prepare it you know, for, the, for the modeling. Come, you know, unlike the, the uh, other, other you know, specialized systems like tomotherapy or cyber knife, where it comes with the beam, uh, beam modeled. So the answer is that. So the, uh, another recent work that is published in, in medical physics in 2015 is, is um, automating LINAC in a quality assurance. This is a very nice work and a comprehensive work. Here they took an approach of using you know, Dynalog files, log files, and EPID, you know, combining both to see whether you can actually test you know, all the possible and all the relevant parameters that we test during acceptance testing or even periodic QA to, to automate that and, in, and give it in a more quantitative way and also efficient way. So if you, if you, look, at, if you look at their work in a jaw-defined field, you know, um, uh, radiation to you know, uh, field size isocenter, MLC defined static pattern, interleaf static pattern, picket fence test for a static gantry or a picket fence test for a gantry while rotating, you know, they kind of use you know, either EPID analysis or a log file analysis to basically determine the accuracy of, of those. A sliding window with variable gantry speed, sliding window with variable gantry speed and variable dose rate tests. So all these things are basically uh, using log files and uh, EPID, EPID QA. So, you know, so all these, you know, they also have, you know, looked at uh, seven to eight true beams um, and, and try to figure out whether the consistency between, you know, big, you know, from LINAC to LINAC to LINAC. So this kind of helps them to benchmark one LINAC against the other LINAC from a mechanical, you know, um, ability point of view. Um, it, you know, you know dosimetrically we can have beam parameters, we can compare with golden beam data or water scans, but this also provides you a way to do the mechanical test um, in, a, in a quantitative and an automated fashion. So what are the outstanding you know, challenges you know, um, in, this, in this process? We do QAs all the time, but you know, understanding the purchase order specification and how it, how it, how it matches with the delivered, you know, what kind of a checklist that one needs to have, because if you look at the, the code that the vendor provided, it's not very clear on what we are actually getting. Um, how to set tolerances when vendor uses their own proprietary tools, you know? and determine their tolerances, you know, how you can map that back to, you know, what, what is actually recommended 
by reports. How about new technologies like you know, flattening filter free or ICVI, SR, SR scones accepted testing? You know, when, when something that is new to, to vendors, because the, the, the variant new cones, you know, you know, we had a big issues. If you are from Texas, you would know that um, you know, we had um, you know, the state kind of you know, sanctioned you know, fines both on the customer and also for on the variant when they had the brain lab cones because it didn't have interlocks. You know, because interlocks is one of the requirements for the state for, for delivering radiation equipments. But we don't know whether it is whose responsibility to hold the vendor accountable you know, to have an interlock system. So we went, we were not being able to use cones in, in, in the state for, for almost 14, 15 months before Varian came up with ICVI SRS cones. And in my practice, it took me seven, it took me seven weeks and we did acceptance testing three times for the ICVI cones, partly because you know, the vendor wants to do only one cones, which is a, you know, a, you know, um, um, uh, a larger cones, and they don't want to use you know um, a Vincent Lust test kind of a uh, verification, but they wanted to use a, a micro um, a meter detector to figure out you know how accurate their their cone positioning is. So it's kind of dif and it's kind of difficult when you don't have a set recommendation to argue with them that you know this is how we wanted we wanted you to do for each and every cones the the um, the isocentric uh, positional verification, and also we wanted to do with radiation rather than mechanically measuring it through a micrometer, which is the test that they kind of uh, recommended, which we cannot reproduce. Hand over checklist, you know, you know, when, when, you know, typically when I, when the installer's job is done and when they need to turn over to service guy and how that handshake should happen, and as a, as a, you know, uh, clinical uh, customer, we are in the middle, when that handshake doesn't happen properly, you know, when you start commissioning and when things are not going going proper, who you'd call, you know? So there are, there are some issues that are uh, around that. Uh, um, again, you know, other device integration. When you have third-party device that are sponsored through the vendors, how, how that needs to be done. And most importantly is also quantitative data. You know, we need quantitative data to actually for, for future reference and also for, you know, ensuring that, you know, we actually transfer that into the planning system and other, other stuff. Um, beam tuning and beam matching if purchased, you know, if you're a, you know, you know there are some, you know, customers that, um, that have complained that, you know, the beam matching is not being, being done properly because of different flattening filters. The vendor sells the, you know, beam matching program, but they're not able to match it, you know, either with, the, with, the, with their own in, in a criteria or with the planning system, and you leave the customer in the limbo where you, you don't know. Most of the time, you know, you know, the administrators are involved in in these discussion, and and the and and you know, we have some miscommunication between vendors and the administrator happens, and it kind of leads to frustration at the time of acceptance testing. So these things needs to be clearly stated at the at the uh, uh, you know in the in the contractual document. So you know the, another another interesting thing is also you know when when I was looking you know, for some of these things from my residents that I came across IAEA is a is a is a reference. So IAEA tells you know following completion of the acceptance test, the completion the completion of all the commissioning tasks, the task associated with placing a treatment unit in clinical use can be estimated to require 1.5 to 3 weeks per energy. You know, I basically went over and looked at it multiple times, you know, whether, you know, this is what they are recommending. You know, this includes not only, you know, collecting the data and accepting testing, but also modeling and making it ready for clinical use per energy, you know. You know, they are in the stating, you know, 1.5 to 3 weeks. You know, I don't think, you know, our administrators will have that much patience. But, you know, this, this kind of lead, lead to, you know, you know, you know one, of, one of my, uh, my story, you know, when I bought my, you know, uh, my minivan, you know, I have two sons, and, uh, and when I got my second son, I went and bought uh, uh, the Honda Odyssey minivan, and, you know, uh, 15th minute, you know, I had my car seats in, I had my, you know, kids in the car seat, and we were driving. Okay. Of course, I did adjust my rear view mirrors and side mirrors, but I didn't spend eight weeks commissioning my, you know, you know, minivan in a Honda Odyssey. You know, Honda Odyssey has close to you know thirty thousand parts in it, but we didn't we didn't do that. The question here is, uh, you know, um, you know, why you know 
we need to leave up to chance. If you look at 2008 reports on risk profile um, from, from, from a World Health Organization on adverse event, reported adverse event, you know, a significant portion of them are from commissioning. The, the highest you know, uh, events are from treatment planning and the next one is treatment delivery. So commissioning had a significant portion of it because it depends upon several different, uh, several different aspects, you know, whether we wanted to do that, you know, in, in, in uh, whether it's a responsive, should, should, if you're buying a $3.8 million machine, you know, whether it should come commissioned, you know? So that is, a, that is, that is something, to, uh, something to think about. So um, IAEA recommends what amount of time to spend per energy for commissioning a, for commissioning a uh, machine is uh, one to two days, five to seven days, 1.5 to three weeks, two months, as much time as possible. So 1.5 to 1.5 to three weeks, you know, that's basically it. So you know, so what, what you know, it's a very challenging as a part of as a part of in a TG210. You know, the goal for us is to kind of it's a challenging task group because we need to get the vendors involved. You know, and we also wanted to propose and you know, incorporate in a you know an efficient process and also a safe process. You know, still give enough time for the you know, uh, physicists to get used to the machine and also understand the machine and also focus more on, you know, critical aspects of the, you know, program commissioning rather than trying to, you know, you know, work on getting this machine and collect the data and spend a, a lot of time and trying to make, you know, the two percent and you know, two millimeters match um, and give a clear set of tolerance. And also there is also a challenge going down this approach, you know, is also to, one is number one is to get all the vendors on the same page. The other thing is, if you take commissioning away, you know, from from uh, from you know, physicists, you know, a lot of consulting physics is is, is also you know, um, you know, jobs are also going to be in 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 uh, in, in uh, jeopardy. So we need to talk with the professional professional council to see whether this is something that uh, um, you know you know you know that is something that is doable. Uh, but it makes it makes sense for us to do things like this because we're already doing you know things like that with tomotherapy and uh, and cybernet planning systems where it comes uh, commissioned along with the machine so you know that's the goal quantitative and automated clear tolerance and specification with no variability depending upon who and how the test is performed clearly defined contractual specification which is easily verifiable Comprehensive for of all component tests with clinical relevance parameters rather than functional tests that we are doing right now. Ready for clinical use. This is a big if, you know, whether we can you know, convince all parties involved. Allow enough time to train on the machine and reduce time from installation to patient treatment. Uh, um, so that is basically the goal of TG in, in a 210 is to aggregate all this data, incorporate uh, the current work that is happening, and you know, trying to make the AT and the commissioning process kind of Kind of overlap a little bit, a little bit if possible, um, and and make it safe. Um, that's where. That's that's the talk.